Hello everyone and welcome back to Microbiology. Today we'll be discussing Chapter 6, Acellular Pathogens, Part 1. As you are about to learn, acellular pathogens lack many features of a cell, especially a plasma membrane and ribosomes. For this reason, they are considered acellular. Like a hostile takeover, they infect a cell and divert cellular machinery and resources into the production of more acellular pathogens. They include viruses, viroids, which infect plants and are smaller than viruses, virusoids, which are circular, single-stranded RNAs that rely on other viruses for multiplying, and prions, which are infectious proteins. So what is a virus? Viruses are infectious agents. They are composed of nucleic acids, which can be in the form of DNA or RNA, and are enclosed in a capsid, which is a protein sheath. As you can see in this image, the nucleic acid is on the inside of the capsid, which houses and protects the nucleic acids. Because viruses lack many of the components of cellular machinery, they are extremely small. They're typically on the range of 20 to 1,000 nanometers. Recall that 1,000 nanometers is equal to one micrometer, and the average bacterial size is somewhere between one and three micrometers. So there are um, viruses that are uh, a couple orders of, uh, or several orders of magnitude smaller than bacteria are, and therefore they cannot be observed under a light microscope. Uh, they are acellular, as already discussed, and because they are acellular, and for other reasons we'll get into, they are not really fully alive. This image here shows uh, a scale of viruses compared to other living organisms. So um, the smallest virus on this scale are bacteriophages, which infect bacteria. And we have poliovirus, rhinovirus, adenovirus, rabies virus, which all infect humans. Uh, we have prions, which are um, just proteins, um, and they can range between 20 and 200 nanometers. Uh, to give you an idea of what 20 nanometers is, it's about the distance of the plasma membrane from end to end, inside to outside. Here we have other bacteriophages, the T4 bacteriophages at about 225 nanometers. Here we have a tobacco mosaic virus. This is a plant virus. We have viroids. As discussed earlier, these are plant viruses. We have vaccinia virus, which um, infects mammalian cells. Here we have another bacteriophage at 800 by 10 nanometers and uh, a Ebola virus at 970 nanometers. If you look below, that uh, gives us a reference to bacterium. So chlamydia bacterium, which are very small bacterium. Uh, here we have at about 300 nanometers. A uh, typical bacterium cell here is E. coli at one micrometer by three micrometers. And the eukaryotic human red blood cell, which is about 10 micrometers in diameter. Some viruses can reach the upper limits of these uh, ranges. The Pandora virus group um, is a group of amoeba viruses with very large genomes and very large sizes. Their genomes, which are the regions where the genes are stored, are 2.5 megabases long. A base, a nucleotide base, is the letter in the language, the, the code of life for the genomes. And to put that into context, a E. coli cell, which is a cell, again, it has to keep track of all of these different cellular machineries, and it's a very complex, you know, cellular factory. 
Um, and E. coli cell is 4.6 megabases long. And a human cell is 3 billion bases long, which is even more complex. And these Pandora viruses can be so large, they actually are an exception to that rule um, of not being able to be visible under a light microscope. They can be visible under a light microscope, and that's because they can have uh, sizes as big as the width of an E. coli. This uh, particular one in this image here can be greater than 0.7 micrometers in size. And an E. coli cell is about one micrometer in width. So why aren't viruses really alive? The biggest reason is they are not uh, masters of their own metabolism. They cannot do metabolism independently. And one of the definitions for life forms is they have to be able to metabolize. They have to be able to uh, create larger molecules and use energy in the process and break down molecules in order to create energy. And viruses are really thought of as just being inert particles um, unless they are actually inside of a host to infect. They just sort of house genetic material and are carriers of that genetic material. And they rely on their host cell machinery to carry out all of their processes. And because of this relative simplicity of a virus, it can be extremely difficult to target um, components and processes of a virus because they actually just use that of our own cells. So by targeting them, we may in fact just target our own cells. And so drugs can be toxic towards us as well. Let's talk a little bit about the viral structure of these. It, when a virus is fully formed and all of the nucleic acids are bundled and it's packaged and it has all of its uh, parts assembled, they are called virions. This image, you can see a wide variety of their shapes and sizes that they come in. Virions must contain their nucleic acids. They must contain a protein capsid that houses those nucleic acids. Sometimes they have an envelope. Um, if they are an enveloped virus, uh, they need to have that envelope present. And that envelope is something that encases that capsid, a protein capsid. And lastly, sometimes they are even packaged with viral enzymes. So um, whatever the case may be, uh, in order to be called a virion, it has to have all of the components of a full virus um, in order to be called such. Viral genomes are also extremely interesting, and that is because they have a wider variety in how they can store their genetic information. In cells, all hereditable uh, genes, genes that are passed down from one generation to the other, are stored in DNA, which is a form of nucleic acids. It's short for deoxyribonucleic acids, and that uh, is a type of nucleic acid which has extra oxygen in it, which we'll learn about in the next chapter. But viruses can store their uh, genomic information in both DNA or RNA. In fact, they can store it in single-stranded or double-stranded DNA. So we always store ours in double-stranded DNA, and they can do either. Uh, they can also do linear or circular versions of their DNA. And in bacteria, we know that they have circular DNA. And in eukaryotes, such as ourselves, we have linear DNA, linear chromosomes. Let's continue our discussion of viral structure with the capsid and envelope. Again, the capsid is a protein sheath that protects the viral genome. It's compo composed of protein subunits called capsomeres, and it varies in structure depending on nucleic acid. The envelope 
is a layer of lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates that covers the capsid of some viruses. It may be similar in structure to a cellular membrane, and it may be covered in spikes that define the virus's host range. If we look at this image here from the book, the, uh, the, the viral genomic material, the nucleic acid, is the center string that's depicted here. The blue spheres that surround that nucleic acid are the capsomeres that make up the capsid. And on the very outside is the, uh, the envelope, if present. And the little green spikes are, of course, the um, spikes that can be present as well and define the host range. Host range describes the species and or cell types that a given virus can infect. For example, bacteriophages can infect bacteria. So their host range is limited to bacteria. H1N1 influenza has a host range that includes humans and pigs. A virus's ability to infect a cell depends upon its specific mechanism for attaching to receptors on a host cell. So on the outside of a cell, we know it's not just a, uh, a blank sheet of uh, plasma membrane or outer membrane but it actually has proteins that can be embedded within that protein and carbohydrates and other types of lipids. And so these components act as receptors that can be identified by a virus for attachment. When you see H a number, N a number, that is actually identifying the types of spikes that are present on that virus. So H1N1, has a hemagglutinin 1 and a neuraminidase 1. And um, as a consequence, uh, that um, allows it to attach to certain cells that are in pigs or humans. As we showed earlier, there are many morphological types of viruses. Helical viruses are long rods with a cylindrical capsule. Capsomeres are arranged in a helical-like uh, fashion where, in which the nucleic acid is attached. So here we see this kind of makes sort of a helical staircase that winds up along with the nucleic acid. An example of a helical virus is the Ebola virus seen here in this transmission electron mi microscope. Polyhedral viruses are usually icosahedron shaped, and that means that they have 20 equilateral triangular faces. So you can see here's one triangle, and then here's another triangle face, and um, they all add up to 20. And here's a transmission electron microscope image of a polyhedral virus. Uh, adenoviruses and polioviruses are examples of these. Next are enveloped viruses, which have helical or polyhedral capsids that are enclosed in a spherical envelope. Examples of this include flu viruses and herpes viruses. Then there are the complex viruses, which have structures with multiple components. Uh, for example, a combination of a helix and a polyhedral. A good example of this is a bacteriophage, as can be seen here to the right, which has a capsid head that contains the DNA, a sheath which connects to a base plate, and tail fibers. And it has spikes that allow for attachment. And when this virus finds the correct host and it attaches, it will inject, like a hypodermic needle, the DNA through the sheath and into the organism. Here we can see a transmission electron microscope image of those bacteriophages. Okay, now checkpoint one. What morphology is exhibited by Marburg virus?
And checkpoint two, what is the function of the structures indicated in A and B? A is pointing at the little kind of tan or yellow things that are studded around the virus. And B is pointing at the green um, with the green subunits inside Okay, now we are ready to discuss viral replication. The mechanisms that viruses use to replicate are an important subject of study because these are the processes itself, or rather its consequences, that lead to a disease state. All viral replication schemes follow the same basic series of steps. The first is attachment, where the virus interacts with the receptors on the host cell. Next is penetration. The virus penetrates the host cell wall and or membrane. The third is biosynthesis, where the virus hijacks host cells to make more virion parts. Next is maturation, where newly made virion parts are assembled into full viruses. And finally, release, where new viruses are released from the host cell to infect others. There are, of course, viruses that infect plants and protozoa, but discussion of these is beyond the scope of the class. Um, replication schemes may vary depending on a virus's nucleic acid type and host range. We are going to consider bacteriophages, animal viruses. And within animal viruses, we will cover DNA viruses, RNA viruses, retroviruses. Bacteriophages, again, have bacteria as their hosts. They have a very complex morphology that we've discussed. They are non-enveloped. They have double-stranded DNA as their genome, and they have two replication mechanisms. They have the first one, lytic. Um, an example of this is the T11 bacteriophage, and lysogenic. An example of this replication mechanism uh, is followed by the, the lambda phage. The lytic cycle has attachment and penetration. Attachment occurs with tail fibers which attach to receptors on the bacterial cell wall. Penetration, where the viral enzyme phage lysozyme breaks down part of the cell wall. The viral tail contracts and injects the DNA into the host cell. So, once in there, we have a biosynthesis and maturation where the virus shuts down transcription and translation of host cell DNA. And uh, transcription and translation is the process of reading the DNA code and making proteins out of it. And then uh, the virus uses the host's own enzymes, the host uh, Components such as nucleotides and ribosomes, which we'll discuss uh, in greater detail in the next chapter, and amino acids in order to make their own viral proteins. So they're essentially doing uh, transcription and translation. And instead of using that to make host cell components, they're going to make viral components and proteins. Then we have maturation where viral components spontaneously assemble into complete virions. And lastly, we have release, where the host cell's plasma membrane lyses or breaks apart. This kills the host and releases these new virus cells in order to repeat the process, or viruses, pardon me.
Not all viruses cause death of the host cell. Bacteriophages that undergo the lysogenic cycle are an example. These are called temperate phages, and for a good reason. Induction can be triggered by environmental forces, such as UV exposure to UV light or certain chemicals. It proceeds as follows. So again, we have attachment and penetration, but instead of having the phage DNA separate from the host DNA, it actually integrates into the host DNA. This becomes what is known as a prophage, um, much like you've heard um, prokaryotes are those that are pre-nucleus, the prophage is going to be pre-virus. Then the bacterial cell can go about its business and go through replication. And in the process, it also replicates the, uh, the, the viral prophage. This can then propagate where the uh, nucleic acid material, material that was integrated into the host genome is copied and a uh, nucleic acid phage DNA is created from that. From this, it, if it becomes induced, um, as we discussed, then it can go into biosynthesis and maturation where it um, elicits the help of the cellular machinery to make more uh, viral particles that spontaneously assemble into complete viruses and are lysed. So the consequences of the lysogenic cycle um, can lead to immunity to reinfection. We can have phage conversion. This is where the host cell's traits may be altered by the prophage in its genome. So, you know, just like having different genes in an organism can uh, change its phenotype, having the addition of viral genes um, into the bacterial DNA can affect its phenotype as well. And we can have specialized transduction. This is where fragments of a host genome may be excised along with the prophages during induction, where we make phage DNA packages. And this gets packaged into the new virion and can be transferred when it reinfects here from step to three to four into a new bacteria. Biology is a wonderful field to study if one is interested in the history of our species. And something we discussed earlier in the semester was the theory of endosymbiosis which states that the mitochondrion cell organelles are actually the descendants of bacterium, which were capable of oxygenic respiration, cellular respiration. And that was inside of just about every one of our cells as human beings. And now that we've discussed this lysogenic cycle, I would like to encourage you to think more about just who you are and I would like to share with you this mini review entitled Endogenous Retroviruses in the Human Genome Sequence. So this paper looked at uh, um, the presence of retroviruses in the human genome, as well as things that are considered to be, um, to a degree, kind of relatives of viruses, which are called transposable elements. Transposable elements are very similar to viruses and they may be uh, the remnants of ancient viruses as well. And they have the ability to hop around in our genome and reintegrate in other parts of our genome. So I will read this short little snippet from this um, mini review. It says, one of the many striking findings to come from the sequencing of the human genome is that some 45% of our DNA is composed of transposable elements such as line and alu retro elements and DNA transposons. Around 8% of the genome is derived from sequences with similarity to infectious retroviruses. So yeah, I just wanted to share that with you and hopefully you uh, can take a look at that article more if you would like to. 
But now let's move on to checkpoint three. Checkpoint three, potovirus is a bacteriophage that cannot integrate its DNA into the host genome and kills its host upon release. Which viral life cycle does it exhibit? So viruses are not always dangerous organisms as we think they are, just as bacteria are not all pathogens. In fact, they can help keep our microbiome in check. And scientists are utilizing uh, viruses, in particular bacteriophages, in order to treat um, certain bacterial infections. So the title of this article was The Superbug Killing Phage Therapy May Have Saved a Teen's Life. Here's how it works. So let's cover animal viruses now. Um, hosts are animal cells, of course. There are multiple morphologies of animal viruses, and there are multiple types. Um, again, there's the DNA genome versions, the RNA genome versions, and retroviruses. Animal viruses follow the same basic steps as a bacteriophage in the replicative life cycles, with some variations owing to the different anatomy of the host and the viruses. In this table, we will compare uh, the differences between animal viruses and bacteriophages. So in attachment, we learned that bacteriophages have tell fibers that interact with the cell with receptors on the cell wall. In animal viruses, they have spikes or fibers which interact with receptors on cell membranes. For penetration, the DNA is injected into the host cell with bacteriophages. With animal viruses, um, the entire capsid enters the cell via endocytosis or fusion. Um, for uncoating, the bacteriophage again injects its naked DNA into the host, so there's no uncoating. But because animal viruses enter, their, their entire capsid enters into the host cell through endocytosis or fusion, the genome needs to be released. So the genome is released from the capsid, and that's called uncoating. Then biosynthesis takes place in both of them, where DNA is transcribed and translated in bacteriophage. And this varies quite a bit, however, with animal viruses, because as we discussed, they can be DNA-based genomes, RNA-based, and they also can be a retrovirus, which we'll discuss in greater detail later. Then we have maturation, which is spontaneous in bacteriophages, where they are assembled into complete viruses. And with animal viruses, this can sometimes involve the uh, use of multiple enzymes. In bacteriophages, we learn that um, uh, release uh, will always kill the host cell, but in animal viruses, um, release may not kill the host cell. Here is an image depicting fusion and endocytosis. So um, to start at the top here, we have mentioned that uh, to be a virus, you don't need a enveloped uh, capsid, but they can occur sometimes. So we have two different versions at the top. We have an enveloped virus version and a non-enveloped virus version. A non-enveloped virus version goes through endocytosis, where um, it kind of punctures into the cell. It goes into the cell here and gets um, closed off and enters the cytosol. So you can imagine if as this keeps pushing through, eventually this membrane pinches off and this uh, non-enveloped virus will be released. Uh, we have the envelope viruses, which can go two different paths. So again, this envelope uh, has a membrane, uh, almost like a plasma membrane-like surface to it. And it can go through this process of endocytosis going into the cell, but it can also go another route, which is called fusion with the membrane. Uh, you do not expect this to occur with non-enveloped viruses because they have no envelope to fuse. 
If the fuse is present, then as we can see, it kind of binds to that membrane and becomes uh, enveloped with that membrane and then can be released. The capsid can be released into the cell. In this situation here, there is no fascicle that's formed and released. In endocytosis, you imagine that this forms sort of a bubble that breaks off and floats into the cell. So that brings us to checkpoint four. Which animal virus penetration mechanism is depicted in this cartoon? So here is an enveloped virus and you see as it binds to this plasma membrane, you can see that some of its uh, protein components sort of uh, become mixed in with this membrane here. So how do scientists grow viruses in the lab? As we've looked into, uh, viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. Uh, what that basically means is they must be grown in cells. So like obligate anaerobes must be grown, they're obligated to grow in the absence of oxygen. Uh, anaerobe means without oxygen. Um, these viruses are required to grow inside of cells and that makes them parasites because they are growing um, off of another living organism. And so in order to culture these in a lab, you have to have cells as a medium. And um, this is really important in order to uh, uh, look at them for research and study as well as vaccine development. And one of the easiest cells to grow viruses in is an embryonated egg. The flu vaccine is uh, usually produced via this method. And uh, let's go in more detail about the influenza virus. Uh, we kind of saw this a little bit earlier with the naming of influenza virus. They have H spikes and N spikes. H spikes stand for hemagglutinin, and these are proteins which allow the virus to identify receptors on the host cell. And we have N spikes, which are composed of the enzyme neuraminidase, which allows the virus to break down the host membrane for release. So once again, in these influenza virus strains, we can see the H and N spikes, which define the influenza strain and its host range. Essentially, that's where the naming of these come from. Um, there are some issues with developing an influenza vaccine. Uh, one is that the influenza virus mutates and evolves at a rapid rate, so therefore a new vaccine must be developed each flu season. And beginning almost a year in advance, scientists do their best job to predict which strains and clade or substrain of flu will predominate in the coming season. And sometimes these predictions aren't entirely accurate and the flu vaccination can be um, less effective. H3N2 has been notoriously a tricky strain to develop a vaccine for, um, and it's become the very dominant strain. And this is for a couple reasons. One is that it mutates more often, so uh, it's hard to make a great match to, and prepare that match for a vaccine later on in the year. The other is, like we said, in order to grow viruses, we have to grow them in cells. And H3N2 is more vulnerable to um, adapting to uh, growing inside of eggs. And these changes, these mu inevitable mutations that occur, um, make them less uh, similar to the viruses that are found out in nature. So in 2017 to 2018, a vaccine company began to grow their 
grow their um, flu um, viruses in canine kidney cells instead of chicken eggs. And this has worked a lot better in maintaining the uh, genotype of the viruses. We have several different antiviral drugs that we use for treating viruses. If you recall, because the virus uses the cellular machinery in, a, in order to do its bidding, it's hard to find good targets. Um, a good target is something that is not present in the host cell. For example, peptidoglycan is a great target for many bacteria because uh, human cells don't produce peptidoglycan. One of these is Tamiflu, and Tamiflu inhibits the release of virions by interfering with neuraminidase, which is the end spikes. And then we have Zytovudine, which inhibits the integration of the HIV provirus um, by interfering with reverse transcriptase, which um, we're gonna have to hold a little uh, placeholder there for reverse transcriptase. But what reverse transcriptase does is it converts the RNA uh, genome from the virus into DNA. And then that DNA can integrate into the host's DNA. So these antiviral drugs typically work by inhibiting a specific stage of the viral replication cycle. As time has gone on, we tend to make uh, flu vaccines that are used to um, allow our adaptive immunity to be resistant to more than just one flu strain. Um, we had trivalent flu vaccines for a while and the latest batches have all been quadrivalent. Um, this year's quadrivalent vaccine is good for in a, in a strain of four different influenza viruses the influenza A virus H1N1, the influenza A virus H3N2, the influenza B virus, which is called the Victoria lineage, and the other influenza B virus, Yamagata lineage. There are more antiviral drugs being developed on the market. One of the new ones is Baloxavir. Um, Baloxavir is really interesting and in then it works on a process known as cap snatching. So viruses, again, can't make their own proteins. And so mRNA is what is like a, a script that goes to the ribosome. And that script tells the ribosome how to make the protein. Well, in order for that script to work, it has to have a signature on it and that signature is called this five prime cap and what a viral uh, um, cap snatching does is it grabs these five prime caps and sticks it on their own script and then sends it to the ribosome for trans uh, translation into a protein and so this is called cap snatching and this drug um, baloxavir uh, actually interferes with the ability for a virus to uh, do cap snatching. The other one that a lot of us might be familiar with in the news is rem remdesivir. And uh, remdesivir is currently being explored for a treatment for uh, our recent uh, coronavirus um, issues we've been having lately. Remdes remden uh, sorry. Remdesivir is considered a nucleoside analog. So um, what that means is that it imitates one of those bases, one of those letters in the alphabet of our uh, genomes. In particular, it does this for viral genomes. So it has a ribonucleotide analog, which is similar to the nuclear letter, nucle uh, nucleotide letter, adenosine triphosphate, seen on the right hand. If you look on the right hand side, you can see uh, what an adenosine triphosphate is supposed to look like. So the adenosine, the nitrogen space, is what they call it, is in this corner here. 
And it's very similar to the nitrogenous base in the remdesivir. However, it is uh, a little bit different in that it's attached to uh, a different structure altogether. So um, the nitrogenous base in adenosine triphosphate is linked to a sugar called ribose. Um, but over here, it is not linked to a sugar. It, is a, it mimics it with this five-membered ring, but it has this uh, C carbon triple bonded to a nitrogen here. And as a consequence, this uh, remdesivir ribonucleotide analog, it tricks the viral RNA polymerase into thinking that this is an adenosine triphosphate. And when the genome is being replicated, it will insert these if present. And this will lead to a termination of the replication process and interfere with viral replication. Checkpoint five, amantadine is an antiviral drug that is used to treat influenza virus by binding to and inhibiting the viral protein M2, which is necessary for release of the viral capsid's contents into the cell. Which stage of the influenza viral life cycle is targeted by amantadine? Okay, so we asked earlier what are acellular pathogens. We discussed that they are um, um, not living. They lack essential cellular uh, components that allow them to do their own metabolism. And they lack uh, a plasma membrane and very important things like ribosomes. We have just had a look at viruses, which have dominated the conversation. Let's talk a little bit about the others. So. We have viroids, which are um, short strands of circular RNA. They lack the capsids present in viruses, and they replicate after infecting the host cells, and they usually infect plants. We also have virusoids, which should not be confused with viroids. Virusoids are uh, similar to viruses, only they're a single-stranded piece of RNA. And again, unlike viruses, they have no capsid. And uh, they replicate after an infecting, uh, after infecting host cells. These are usually plants again. But they are, these host cells are, have already previously been infected with another virus, which are called helper viruses. And these helper viruses allow these virusoids to replicate. Prions are quite different from what we've discussed. Um, prions don't have nucleic acids at all. They are just protein and protein alone. And all known prion diseases are neurodegenerative diseases of the brain. And what happens is the you have a normal protein and these proteins can be, um, their structure can be altered. And so this becomes a disease causing protein. And why they're infectious agents is because a disease causing protein or a pr prion can actually interact with a healthy protein um, in your brain or in, in a brain and cause it to become a unhealthy protein. And so that's kind of how it spreads um, throughout. There are many different types of prions that we should be familiar with. We have scrappy and mad, mad cow disease, which are both transmissible spongy form encephal encephalases. We have Kuru, we have Grutzfeld, Jacob disease, and fatal familial insomnia. And one thing you need to be aware of is that prion diseases appear to be both transmissible and inheritable. Kuru has an interesting past. It was first discovered 
um, or it was discovered among the four tribe of Papua New Guinea. And the disease was linked to cannibalism of brain matter in 1957. Um, 140 out of the 154 affected were adu adults were females. And the reason why this was occurring was dead members of the tribe were eaten as a way to release the spirit. And it was customary for women and children to eat the brain. And with that is the end for acellular pathogens part one. Um, we'll continue our discussion next time. Thank you so much for joining me and we'll see you again.